Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us in this lecture arranged jointly by the Center of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies and the Seoul Academy. I'm your host, Rubayat Yamin. Tonight, we are to have the sixth lecture of the series, Applied Multiplexity, Ibn Khaldun as an example. The aim of the series is to understand Ibn Khaldun's multiplex approach to social science. The title of tonight's lecture is Ibn Khaldun on Cyclical History, Rise and Fall of Civilization. The lecturer is Professor Dr. Rajab Shantur. Professor Dr. Shantur uh, is the Dean of the College of Islamic Studies at Hamad bin Khalifa University, Qatar. He was a former founding president of Ibn Khaldun University in Istanbul. He holds a PhD from Columbia University's Department of Sociology and specializes, uh, specializes in civilization studies, sociology, and Islamic studies with a focus on social networks, human rights, and a modernization in the Muslim world. He served as a lecturer, uh, sorry, he served as a researcher at the Center of Islamic Studies in Istanbul and is the founding director of the Alliance of Civilizations Institute. He is the head of the International Ibn Khaldun Society and has a seat on the editorial boards of multiple academic journals. Among his books are, in English, Narrative Social Structure, Hadith Transmission Network, uh, 610 to 1505, and in Turkish, Open Civilization Towards a Multi-Civilizational Society and World, Ibn Khaldun, Contemporary Readings, Malcolm X, Struggle for Human Rights, and Social Memory, Hadith Transmission Network, 610 to 1505. Professor Dr. Shantuk's work has been translated to Arabic, Japanese, and Spanish. Um, uh, now, uh, so that is a short intro of tonight's lecture. Now, a few words about the format. Uh, the lecture will take around 30 to 45 minutes. The lecture will then be followed by comments and question uh, and question answer section, will take around, which will take around 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, we observe a few rules as well. So we ask our audience to please keep the mic and mobile muted until told otherwise. Uh, we encourage questions and discussions focused on the lecture only. And we also encourage attendees to take notes on the lecture for the comments and question and answer section. So now without further ado, I'd like to ask Professor Dr. Rajiv Shantur to deliver the lecture along with an introduction to Usul Academy. Over to you, Dr. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we will be talking about uh, Ibn Khaldun on cyclical uh, history, rise and fall of civilizations. Uh, this is the sixth le lecture uh, in a series about applied multiplexity, Ibn Khaldun as an uh, example. Uh, in the title of the lecture, I have mentioned that uh, uh, this lecture is about the cyclical understanding of history. Uh, there are different visions of uh, history, uh, and the most commonly used one is the linear vision of uh, history, and it's the most dominant one uh, today. Uh, so according to linear view of history, there is a single uh, process of history from the beginning of history up until today and the end of uh, history. So the whole humanity uh, goes through a single process of uh, uh, history and this history moves in a progressive fashion. So there's a progress. Uh, the idea of progress assumes that uh, uh, history is a single process and it's unidirectional. Uh, it moves into a particular uh, direction. Uh, uh, there are many examples uh, of it, uh, but the most commonly used one is this tripartite division of history, uh, antiquity, Middle Ages, and modernity. So you see that uh, it assumes it's like moving forward, always towards something better. 
and uh, the best is in the uh, future. So example or uh, representatives uh, like leading representatives include August Comte, Durkheim, Karl Marx, Hegel, uh, uh, S -S -S George Spencer, and many uh, others. Uh, so this uh, view uh, like emerged during the uh, 19th century with the rise of uh, modernity. People were very ho hopeful uh, that the science, uh, reason will bring uh, uh, a better uh, future to uh, humanity. And they assumed there is a linear uh, progress towards something uh, better. Uh, uh, however, you know, it came uh, to be criticized uh, when people became disillusioned about the positive impact of uh, science and uh, reason, uh, especially after World War II. Uh, and this period is called postmodern uh, period. And in the postmodern period, people lost trust in reason, in science, and also in uh, progress. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, this view of linear uh, uh, progress uh, in history uh, is now today being criticized uh, in many uh, circles. Uh, uh, the opposite uh, of the linear view of history is what you call cyclical view of uh, history. Uh, according to this uh, view, uh, there, uh, history is not a single uh, process. There are multiple processes going on uh, simultaneously uh, at the same time. While may uh, one civilization is rising, another civilization may be falling. Uh, and uh, so rise and fall of uh, civilizations uh, taking place simultaneously in the world. Uh, and uh, this is what I call paradox of civilizations. Uh, the more a civilization uh, progresses or rises, the closer it to fall. So this is a, this is like a paradox. Uh, so uh, uh, <laughs> civilizations, follow uh, patterns, like circular patterns, genesis, growth, decline, and disintegration. Uh, so Ibn Khaldun, Oswald Spengler, Aldor Toynbee, and many others, they accept this uh, circular uh, perspective. Uh, but the postmodernist approach rejects the cyclical approach also. Uh, their perspective is more like a chaotic. Uh, no, no order uh, in history, neither linear nor uh, cyclical. So that's the uh, postmodern approach. Um, so uh, examples for linear conceptions of history, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Durkheim, uh, he argued that uh, there is a movement uh, in history from mechanical solidarity which is uh, the character of uh, ancient primitive societies to organic solidarity, which is the attribute of modern industrial uh, societies. So uh, his approach to uh, progress or social evolution was a functionalist uh, approach. And uh, Karl Marx, uh, again, uh, he also shared this uh, idea of uh, progress, but uh, his approach was based on uh, production. And uh, he argued that uh, uh, societies progress from primitive uh, communism and slave society to feudalism, to uh, capitalism, socialism, and uh, communism. So this was his uh, uh, view of uh, progress. Uh, 
and when you know humanity reaches the stage of socialism or communism uh, history comes to an end uh, after that there is no more uh, progress according to marx and the weber uh, came up with an uh, idea based or idealist uh, perspective so he argued that the ancient primitive societies they were irrational societies but modern societies they are rational and they built uh, rational uh, systems uh, so this was Weber's uh, approach uh, and the August Comte has another one I mean there are many other uh, examples of uh, this uh, linear uh, progressive uh, approach to uh, history uh, it was commonly shared by uh, almost all uh, enlightenment and modern uh, thinkers uh, uh, except a few of them you know, uh, followed this uh, cyclical view of uh, history they were influenced from uh, Ibn Khaldun so according to Ibn Khaldun uh, like societies uh, go through a cyclical uh, process uh, like they rise uh, and then fall and this is in Arabic he called Al-Atwar al khamsa which means five stages so the first uh, phase or first uh, stage is the stage of foundation or the rise of a society the second one is the personalization of power stage and the third stage is the growth and expansion stage and the fourth stage is stagnation stage of stagnation and the fifth stage is decline and dissolution dissolution uh, stage uh, so he uh, 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 used some uh, criteria uh, for all these stages in particular the the concept of asabiya and asabiya according to him is very strong in the beginning of a civilization uh, of a state but uh, uh, the more a society develops uh, uh, increases uh, its uh, prosperity gets uh, richer uh, sabiya gets weaker and eventually in the fifth stage uh, asabiya reaches its weakest uh, level and this is the end of uh, the uh, society and uh, uh, so in the beginning uh, of the rise of a civilization or a society people are strongly linked to each other there is solidarity there's a bondage uh, among themselves a high level of uh, chivalry loyalty to the uh, reader and strong obedience to uh, religion uh, uh, but uh, uh, in the second uh, 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 phase uh, uh, this uh, bondage this strong connection with each other and uh, uh, and solidarity gets uh, weakened uh, a, a professional army is uh, established and the power concentrates in one single uh, leader uh, and uh, in the third stage the state grows civilization expands uh, people get rich leisure and tranquility uh, increase big uh, monuments are built in architecture and this was called hadara hadara so the first stage is like bedawe uh, and then the third stage the hadara the civilization the uh, 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 urban uh, urbanization uh, increase uh, people get rich and uh, they start enjoying luxuries life uh, the state becomes very strong very rich but uh, uh, there's a paradox you know this uh, prosperity wealth 
richness, uh, 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 luxury, they undermine moral and social foundations of a society. Uh, they undermine asabiya. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, as a result, uh, inexperienced big leaders uh, emerge and uh, the bureaucracy becomes incompetent and uh, people become immersed in uh, luxury. They want to enjoy nice food, you know, nice days, you know, uh, and they lose their uh, preparedness to make a war, to defend their uh, country. You know, they all run after comfort, lavish lifestyle. You know, uh, they want to get richer and richer, uh, and they develop some bad habits. Uh, individualism uh, develop at this uh, stage uh, instead of uh, strong uh, group uh, uh, bondage. Uh, and in the fifth uh, 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 stage, uh, people get involved in waste, uh, extravagant uh, consumption, and uh, uh, bureaucracy becomes like dysfunctional, uh, and uh, slowly the state starts uh, losing uh, money. Uh, you know, people become like so selfish and egoistic. The only thing they care is about uh, themselves. Uh, immoral uh, uh, habits, you know, spread in uh, society, and. Uh, 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 when people make mistakes, rather than accepting their mistakes, they blame previous generations as the cause of uh, the uh, problems. And this is the lowest level of uh, asabiya, and uh, no more uh, strong uh, uh, solidarity uh, in the group, no more uh, bondage, no more uh, unity, divisions, fragmentations, internal uh, fights, uh, etc. So that's the end of the uh, uh, civilization. That's the end of state and uh, society. Uh, while one society goes through this uh, and uh, dissolves and uh, declines, another society comes from the periphery uh, with the Badawa spirit with a strong uh, asabiya and replaces that uh, society. But uh, they also go through the same uh, process. Eventually, they are also uh, uh, you know, uh, they also get rich and uh, prosperous, uh, powerful, but this uh, extreme uh, power prosperity and wealth has negative impacts. They have negative impact on the social bondage of that society also. They also collapse. Uh, uh, so uh, these uh, five phases are called Atvar uh, Hamse in Ibn Khaldun. So it's a cyclical uh, process. Uh, all societies go uh, through it. Uh, uh, so uh, you, I mean, according to this uh, perspective, you see that uh, there is no permanent society. There is no eternal uh, state. Uh, uh, so all states, societies, and civilizations, they have a lifetime. Uh, and uh, and there's a paradox. Uh, uh, the more they develop, the more they are in danger to uh, collapse. Uh, so Ibn Khaldun follows the Muslim theologians Mutakallimun in his classification of existing beings, uh, pre-eternal and originated, Qadim and Hadith. Uh, everything other than Allah, that all created beings have originated existence. So they are all uh, Hadith, Hadith, uh, which is contingent and dependent on a cause beyond themselves. Uh, these temporal beings, Alamul Hawadith, the natural and social world are subject to the same principle of impermanency 
lacking any inherent quality of continuity or stability. Ibn Khaldun draws an analogy in the life of a civilization and that of a human being, uh, a, a living organism, uh, uh, as both belong to the same ontic category of contingent beings. Uh, they are all hadith and uh, they are all destined you know, to grow, uh, uh, become powerful, and then decline and demise. Uh, uh, this uh, perspective leads him to propose that social and cultural structures undergo recurring patterns of birth, growth, maturity, and decline, akin to the life stages of a living organism, thus molding his theory into a cyclical form characterized by the rise and fall of civilizations. Uh, as I have already uh, mentioned, uh, he uses uh, asabiya as a variable, uh, changing variable in every uh, stage of uh, civilization. Uh, Ibn Khaldun's cyclical theory of social change places the concept of asabiya or social cohesion, social solidarity, group feeling, uh, social unity, at the heart of political and social transformations. Uh, the levels of asabiyya within a group or society is not constant. It changes and evolves over time. So the group solidarity, the asabiyya, uh, in the first uh, phase, uh, uh, it occurs uh, in the early stage of, of a dynasty when a cohesive group often tribal rises to uh, power. Uh, but uh, tribal uh, groups, uh, we should not think that uh, they disappeared in the past. Uh, today, like political parties uh, replaced the old tribes. Uh, so they may also be treated like a tribe uh, or like other uh, groups, uh, social uh, groups, uh, they are united by strong bonds of asabiyya and are able to take control over a region or a state. Uh, uh, established of a dynasty and urban society, this is the second uh, phase. Uh, so what happens to uh, asabiyya in this uh, stage? This newly empowered group establishes a dynasty and the ruling elite. The society tends to become more urban and less tribal. Uh, in the third stage, which is the peak and, pro, uh, and uh, the highest level of prosperity uh, of a civilization and society, the society and the dynasty reach their peak in terms of power and prosperity. The rulers enjoy the fruits of power, which leads to the weakening of the asabiyya that brought them to power. And the fourth stage, uh, decay and corruption. Uh, emerge, the rulers become complacent, corrupt, and detached from their subjects. Uh, they begin to lose the asabiyya that originally provided social cohesion and solidarity. And in the fifth uh, stage, which is the stage of decline and fall, uh, eventually the dynasty loses its grip on power and is overthrown by a new group within a stronger asabiyya the cycle then repeats. So this new group, which comes from the periphery, moves in the center, uh, takes over the state, starts you know, gaining more and more power, more and more wealth, but it also goes through the same cyclical uh, process. Um, uh, so there's a paradox, the paradox of, of affluence and the fate of uh, states. Uh, so uh, uh, in modern political theory, uh, for instance, uh, Marx uh, is argued that material affluence and wealth are essential for the rise and maintenance of strong states. Is it true? Ibn Khaldun argues differently. 
you know, uh, he argues that economic progress actually leads to the collapse of political entities, excessive affluence, wealth, and luxury. If the necessary measure, measures are not taken, eventually erode the moral and military power of society. You know, uh, it erodes the political power of society. When rulers and their associates become absorbed in luxuries, extravagant lifestyle, they lose the character qualities necessary for effective governance, such as determination and uh, pros, shaja and bath, uh, this uh, bravery, this weakness and softness make them vulnerable and unfit for rule, ultimately resulting in the decline of political entity. Thus, Ibn Khaldun's argument challenges the conventional belief in the positive correlation between affluence and political strength. Uh, uh, so rather than you know, uh, arguing for a correlation, he argues that uh, there is a, a paradoxical relationship uh, between the two. Uh, however, uh, this brings to mind, uh, is Ibn Khaldun a predeterminist person? Uh, is he a fatalist? Is this a rise and decline, you know, a destiny that cannot be uh, avoided? Uh, and uh, is it necessary for all societies go through these five uh, stages and to fall? Um, so there are like different uh, interpretations uh, about this, uh, but uh, Barbara Stawasser says that it's not necessary for every social organization to go through these stages. Permanency of the state, permanency of a society, permanency uh, of a civilization is possible, but with a condition provided that God's law is followed by people, like the Sharia, Islam is followed by uh, people. So he, she wrote, underneath his pragmatism, Ibn Khaldun lets, let us perceive his deeper conviction, the conviction that adherence to the true religion, which is Islam, can and should ensure the creation of God's kingdom on earth an everlasting golden age. It and when this is achieved, he tells us civilizations need not and will not rise and fall again. Uh, so, uh, so this explains the secret why uh, some states lived very long time. Uh, this is the Ottoman state around like seven centuries. Uh, uh, What's the secret uh, behind this? Uh, uh, so uh, loyalty to Islamic uh, principles of uh, humility, uh, 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 limited uh, consumption, staying away from showing off, extravagance, leisure and luxury. Uh, these are part of uh, like Islamic morality and ethics uh, uh, and they are uh, derived from the Sunnah of uh, Prophet Muhammad. Uh, so if people you know, practice these values, uh, derived from Sunnah of uh, Prophet Muhammad, leisure, luxury, prosperity, power, will not have any negative impact uh, on them. But uh, if they abandon these moral principles, uh, which protects them from the negative impact of wealth and power, they are uh, destined to lose uh, their uh, state and society. Uh, so there is a uh, uh, con, uh, there is a there, there is a dilemma. Uh, you know, there is a uh, uh, adversarial relationship between morality, ethics, and economic progress in uh, Ibn Khaldun. Uh, so he wrote uh, that, uh, that the foundation of great 
and lasting political powers lies in religion, either through prophethood or through the advocacy of truth. Uh, so if, uh, if uh, the system uh, is not uh, rooted in the teachings of a prophet uh, or, uh, or hug the truth, then lasting political power is not uh, possible. So what makes a political power endure and last is to be grounded on the teachings of uh, prophethood and advocates of uh, truth, nubuwa uh, and haq. So this is because sovereignty is achieved through domination and domination is attained through unity or purpose agreement on aspirations. So uh, he, ittifaqul ahwa ala al-mutalaba wa jam'ul kulu wa ta'lifuha. So like unity of hearts, unity of desires. Uh, so he said, this is necessary. Uh, and this is what he calls al-asabiyya. Uh, such unity can only be achieved with the help of God in establishing his religion. As mentioned in the Quran, had you spent all that's in the earth, you couldn't have brought their hearts together. The secret behind this is that when hearts incline towards false desires and worldly inclinations, competition arises, disputes spread, and differences prevail. However, when hearts turn towards truth, reject the worldly and the false and dedicate themselves to God, their direction becomes unified, competition decreases, cooperation and mutual support improve and scope of unity expands. This is through, it is through this process that a state becomes great uh, as we will explain in detail, God willing, with his guidance and success, there is no Lord but him. Uh, so, uh, so this uh, paragraph explains uh, Ibn Khaldun's view what makes state enduring or everlasting. Uh, in conclusion, uh, uh, I mean, I would like to pose this question: How can we ensure civilizational sustainability? Uh, how can we ensure political, social sustainability? Uh, if we uh, carefully read Ibn Khaldun, he's reminding us that uh, uh, civilizational sustainability, political sustainability, economic sustainability requires epistemic sustainability. And by epistemic sustainability, I mean uh, accepting wahi divine revelation as a source of knowledge and being loyal uh, to that uh, knowledge uh, uh, because uh, through this kind of multiplex uh, epistemology uh, which includes uh, reason sense perception and divine revelation uh, uh, epistemic sustainability is uh, protected and it provides the foundation for moral sustainability. So, uh, so there is a paradox in Ibn Khaldun between moral sustainability and economic sustainability. So uh, you have to keep a balance between uh, maintaining morality and developing economy. If you only focus on a political and economic sustainability and uh, disregards epistemic and moral sustainability, your society is destined to uh, disintegrate and fall. But if you take care of epistemic and moral sustainability while economically progressing, nothing is going to uh, happen because moral uh, morality and uh, the teachings of uh, God and uh, profit uh, will protect the society and individuals 
from the negative corruptive impact of power and uh, and wealth. Uh, all right, uh, so uh, this is the cyclical view of uh, history in uh, Ibn Khaldun. Uh, uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, now uh, we can uh, continue with your questions, comments, and contributions. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Professor Rajiv Shantberg, for the presentation. We hope our audience has taken notes and is prepared for a discussion. Please note that our comments and question answer will focus on the lecture only. So uh, if I can request uh, people to raise your hands uh, by pressing the reaction button, raise your hands and, uh, and go ahead. And uh, uh, so I see uh, a Wazir Baksh's hand up. So. Mr. Wazir, would you please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Um, can we say, based on Ibn Khaldun's uh, theory, that social systems are like biological systems? Uh, no, it's not biological, but uh, they have uh, similar uh, uh, similarities in the life stages they follow. Uh -huh. They reflect similarities, but we cannot say they are completely the same. So there is, uh, so, so uh, like in the Quran, it says, you know, like everything has a lifetime. Uh, so like, uh, like all groups have some uh, time to die. Uh, like, so this kind of, uh, 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 things uh, uh, support the view that uh, there is impermanency uh, of life and the uh, impermanence of life is applicable to living organisms, human beings, animals, plants, you know, and also to states, societies, and civilizations. Uh, so he uh, draws parallels uh, in this regard. Uh, but um, I'm just thinking about, um, I mean, look at the Islamic civilization, which lasted for such a long time. But we see rise and fall of dynasties. Yes. Not the civilization per se, until mm -hmm. in very, not so long ago. So um, I'm just thinking about the whole concept mm -hmm. of, because, um, I have also um, engaged in other studies um, on the idea of aligning strengths, which will make weaknesses irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So this is based on leadership to align strengths, what mm -hmm. exists of what exists. So you make mm -hmm. weaknesses irrelevant and this helps to sustain, you know, so that I'm just thinking, you know, loudly, <laughs> thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, let's uh, distinguish between modern concept of civilization and Ibn Khaldun's concept of civilization. Uh, according to Ibn Khaldun, civilization means society. Society. So Islamic, like modern concept of uh, civilization uh, is, uh, is uh, more general, uh, comprehensive. When you say Islamic civilization, uh, it includes all dynasties, all societies. But when Ibn Khaldun says civilization, uh, uh, he means uh, societies uh, brought together, organized under the leadership uh, of a dynasty or a ruling group. Uh, so let's say uh, like Ottoman state, Safavid state, and the Barbary state. Yeah, the, you know, according to Ibn Khaldun, like each one is Umran, civilization. Uh, but in our modern uh, view, when we say Islamic civilization, from the beginning until now, all dynasties, all states, all groups make one unity. Uh, and this is what's called uh, civilization uh, at the moment. Uh, so Ibn Khaldun does not mean uh, that uh, uh, 
so uh, uh, according to Ibn Khaldun, like there are uh, parallel and simultaneous uh, processes going on, let's say, you know, within one particular big civilization. They say, you know, in Islamic civilization, they say from like a video modern usage, maybe like one empire is rising, like one Muslim empire is rising, while other Muslim empire is, uh, you know, falling. One dynasty is right, the other is falling. So he does not unify, uh, uh, you know, people belonging to, uh, to a single religion as a single civilization. And the same way, like he does not unify like all humanity, you know, belonging to a single uh, civilization. For him, civilization means society. So this is a very important uh, difference uh, between the modern concept of civilization and Ibn Khaldun's concept of civilization. So please keep this in mind. Thank you. Professor, and thank you, Ms. Rosia. I see uh, Mr. Mutir Rahman's hand up. I would please request you to uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Assalamu alaikum and Jazakallah. Thank you. It's a beautiful lecture. I'm just thinking of the modern society, the modern West, in terms of a civilization, because at the moment, it has eaten everything, uh, every other so, so you don't have a German state, British state, American state. Seems more like in the age of globalization, just one single society with the asabia of um, equality, fraternity, liberty, uh, progress, all that. So, so just thinking of how do we apply sort of um, Ibn Khaldun's idea on the Asabi of the West. And where are they? So we are seeing huge seismic shifts now, divided nations, uh, Pakistan, uh, as well as um, Turkey, with a slight majority supporting traditional concepts while the, the minority ganging up, getting over. So just interesting to so what's the sort on that because the West now seems to be sort of a hegemonic sort of um, what you say one single unified civilization, and we can see this sort of in my opinion has probably reached this height. Um, what's your thoughts on that, and how would you analyze that the modern West? Yes. Uh, uh... I mean, modern West is a construction, you know, uh, 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 and uh, so now they are uh, trying to move from the concept of nation state to uh, concept of like a, the West. Uh, and I don't know to what extent it will be uh, successful and how long uh, it will uh, survive. Uh, so in 19th century, uh, under the impact of uh, nationalism, they tried to create like Asabiya for France, Asabiya for Germany, Asabiya for Italy, Asabiya for UK. You know, uh, uh, so this uh, the, the impact of nationalism. I mean, it succeeded to a certain extent. Uh, of course, uh, some groups they really did not accept this kind of nationalist uh, discourse uh, and uh, they uh, they resisted to be integrated uh, within the nation uh, melting uh, you know, uh, uh, everything uh, together but uh, now they realized that uh, you know uh, this uh, asabiya based on nationalism is not really good, uh, it's uh, destructive, uh, especially after World War II. Then they want, they try to create a bigger asabiya of, uh, of the Western world. Uh, but uh, I don't know how long it will uh, continue and to what extent it will be successful because there are so many internal tensions and fault lines uh, involved. Uh, 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 
so the war in Ukraine exposed you know, many of those uh, fault lines. Uh, so Russia is West and uh, also you know, Europe is West. Uh, so how come like, they are having fights you know, with uh, each other? And uh, who knows if tomorrow there is an interest conflict you know, between uh, one particular state and the other one, how long this, uh, you know, uh, this uh, constructed Western uh, identity will uh, survive? Uh, so today there is an alliance uh, and it seems uh, you know, there's a superpower bringing them uh, together uh, and they are trying to come up with a, a narrative to uh, to uh, accept you solidify uh, historically solidify this identity of Europe uh, and the West uh, 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 and uh, even if it survives you know, it will go through a particular uh, time and it will uh, demise again you know, if it will follow the circular uh, it's the cyclical uh, uh, style but uh, and as you have said like Muslims are divided this is the in a fifth stage of civilization according to Ibn Khaldun no more like strong Asabiya very weak you know, people are fighting with each other you know, uh, but uh, this is not gonna go forever either as Ibn Khaldun mentions, uh, uh, you know, rise and fall uh, always uh, occur uh, in the world. Uh, uh, so we observed like a rise of the West, but uh, who can say this is permanent? Just, just my thought on who just can say this is permanent? Uh, uh, but people who live in a particular period, uh, they have this impression that uh, the period in which they live will last forever so like people who live in the middle ages you know maybe they thought you know uh, this order in middle ages will last forever and the people who lived in soviet union perhaps they thought this will last forever so you know now we we are in this uh, globalization period and uh, we think or we are under the impression that this will last forever but Ibn Khaldun and people like uh, historians who accept this cyclical view, they say no, uh, no, no uh, power is uh, going to survive uh, forever. I was just about to say, in terms of epistemology that you were mentioning earlier, there seems to be in the academic circles all over the world one epistemology, one word, one progress, one science and there's no sort of substitute. Um, it's just the epistemology of the science have been eaten and dominated and completely discarded. So no other culture survives in the academic area with this epistemology. You're actually, uh, uh, this view you are describing is the enlightenment view, uh, the modern view. This view uh, has been severely criticized by the postmodernist view, you know, uh, in the postmodernist, they argue that uh, there is no, uh, like, uh, we, uh, we cannot trust science, we cannot trust reason, no progress, uh, you know, there isn't like a single uh, humanity moving in one particular uh, direction. Uh, so all these views have been uh, criticized by the postmodernist uh, thinkers. Uh, but still, uh, uh, some of the enlightenment uh, or modern views of uh, of progress, you know, uh, uh, in a veneration of uh, science, of scientism or scientism, uh, they still, uh, you know, survive in some parts of the world or in uh, segments uh, uh, in the academia. But today, the strongest. Uh, uh, ideology is a postmodern ideology which rejects you know, uh, uh, you know trust in science progress social evolution uh, etc they all critically analyze these things and reject them Jazakallah, thank you you're welcome thank you uh, I, uh, 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 Ms. Aisha Sayed, would you please uh, 
Yeah, assalamu alaikum, Hojan. Thank you very much for the insights. I just want to ask that uh, Ibn Haldun in his discussion on the rise and fall of civilization also talks about uh, four dynasties or um, he's talking, uh, sorry, four generations in a dynasty or in a state. So according to that, if you look at the uh, colonial states, it seems as if they are also entering into their fourth generations. So how would you look at that or relate it with Ibn Haldun's theory? Yeah, as I said, uh, uh, the powers uh, at existence today, uh, they will not last forever. Like today, let's say we have American power. In the past, we had German power. We had like a you know, Soviet Union, uh, China, India, Japan. You know, they will not last uh, forever. Uh, and actually, uh, as Ibn Khaldun argues, uh, this increase in power, increase in prosperity and wealth, you know, it's very paradoxical. You know, they come up with some moral uh, ills, some moral problems. Uh, and today you can observe this in like America and Europe, Japan, for instance, uh, decrease in fertility rate, you know, no more marriages, you know, uh, no more, uh, you know, uh, birth. Uh, uh, and then this uh, high level of individualism, lack of social cohesion, uh, you know, people not caring about each other, etc. These are all, you know, uh, 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 observed and predicted by Ibn Khaldun. They undermine uh, social unity and solidarity, uh, which prepares the demise of a, a particular uh, society. I mean, you can observe uh, uh, these things in uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, powerful uh, and rich uh, states and societies uh, today uh, as well. And uh, these uh, illnesses, uh, as they grow, they undermine. Uh, the fabric of those societies undermine their moral uh, system and when they lose their morality completely the whole system uh, collapses and comes uh, to an end uh, so this is Ibn Khaldun's uh, view of it so no state uh, will live forever no civilization will live uh, forever Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so there, there are some uh, comments and questions uh, in the comment section. And if you allow me, I would uh, just uh, read some of them out and uh, get your comment on them. So uh, there was a question from Sayyid Mustafa Akbar. And he asked, was Machiavelli inspired by Ibn Khaldun? And, uh, and this was before you joined. We were having a discussion. Yeah. yeah and then yeah. he, we asked him, and um, he also wrote. I forgot where I read read this, but from what I recall, a figure named Leo Africanus is the one who introduced Machiavelli to the works of Ibn Khaldun. Yes, uh, there are many people uh, who uh, benefited from Ibn Khaldun's views, but they uh, mostly. Uh, you know, could not uh, uh, completely understand and internalize Ibn Khaldun uh, because of the lack of the multiplex uh, uh, worldview in the background. Uh, uh, so some of them uh, interpreted Ibn Khaldun as a materialist. Uh, some of them you know, uh, interpreted as idealist. Some of them interpreted as nationalist. You know, uh, so their interpretations uh, has never been uh, holistic and comprehensive because uh, they lacked uh, in their minds this uh, multiplex worldview, uh, multiplex epistemology and multiplex uh, methodology. So even if you assume, like, uh, you know, even uh, uh, Machiavelli read and benefited uh, uh, from Ibn Khaldun, it seems... Uh, he misread and misinterpreted uh, Ibn Khaldun. Uh, in the same way, 
yeah, like other thinkers uh, in the West, uh, uh, I mean, they read Ibn Khaldun and they mentioned that they read Ibn Khaldun, it's explicit. Uh, 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 but uh, we see that uh, uh, most of them uh, misunderstood or partially grasped one dimension in Ibn Khaldun's uh, thought. Uh, uh, why? Because they lacked this multiplex uh, worldview, multiplex epistemology, and multiplex uh, 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 methodology Ibn Khaldun had in the uh, in in the background as a paradigm. Uh, uh, so uh, so so it's very important, you know, uh, for us to keep in mind. Uh, multiplexity is the uh, ontological, epistemological, and methodological foundation of Ibn Khaldun's thought. Uh, uh, so if you remove uh, this part, uh, you may find some superficial similarities, uh, like between Ibn Khaldun and some Western uh, thinkers. Uh, but this uh, similarity is only very superficial uh, uh, similarity. It should not uh, let us to conflate Ibn Khaldun with that thinker. We should be always very careful to say, wow, Ibn Khaldun and Durkheim is the same. You know, Ibn Khaldun and Marx is the same. You know, uh, or Ibn Khaldun and uh, Foucault is the same. <laughs> you no, know, we have to be very careful about this. You know, there are some similarities, but it is not uh, uh, complete uh, similarity. Why? Because uh, Ibn Khaldun believes in multiplex uh, ontology. Marx believes in materialist ontology. Uh, so how can you, know, uh, you say you know, uh, they are the same? And uh, Ibn Khaldun believes in multiplex epistemology, which includes Wahi, divine revelation, as a source of knowledge. How can you say you know, he and Marx is the same, while Marx does not believe in divine uh, revelation? Uh, so there are... You know, people who see some parallelism between a Western thinker and Ibn Khaldun, and they jump to the conclusion that you know, these are the same. Uh, I mean, pay attention to the uh, para paradigmatic uh, level, ontology, epistemology, and methodology, to basic assumptions about existence, knowledge, method. But then you will realize Ibn Khaldun is very different than uh, those people and similarity is only uh, superficial. Uh. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there's another uh, comment in the chat uh, from Hikmatullah. He says, in his book, Evolution of Civilization, Carol, Carol Quing, uh, Quigley, I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing that right, says that there are seven stages in the rise and fall of civilization. A, gestation, B, mixture, C, expansion, D, universal empire, E, age of conflict, F, decay, uh, G, uh, destruction by invasion. I guess mm -hmm. he's inviting you to comment on that. Uh, yeah. yeah, so this is very similar to Ibn Khaldun. Uh, I don't know uh, 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 this uh, person's work, but it's very right. similar to Ibn Khaldun. Uh, there may be some influence you know, uh, uh, from Ibn Khaldun. Uh, uh, and uh, as I have mentioned in my presentation, uh, there are people who accept a cyclical view of history, like uh, Arnold Toynbee is uh, one of them, the famous uh, you know, British uh, historian. Uh, so uh, uh, Quigley is also similar. Uh, so he, I mean, Quigley also accepts the cyclical view of uh, history and there are many other people you know with similar uh, views uh. um thank you uh professor there's there are some more few, uh, more comments here uh jess jesse wants to know um, seeking forgiveness first and then asking to know how close was there is marxism to uh Ibn Khaldun. i think yes. you've addressed this but mm -hmm. if you choose, you might want yeah. to elaborate on Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like uh, some people see that uh, Ibn Khaldun gives importance to economy and production and uh, the relationship between social structure and economic system. You know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, 
and this uh, leads them to uh, conclude uh, Ibn Haldun uses economy as the uh, as the infrastructure uh, of society which determines everything uh, and then they uh, draw parallelism between Marx and Ibn Khaldun. And uh, uh, there, in Turkey, there was a magazine, you know, it, the headline in the first page was uh, like Ibn Khaldun is the Marx of Muslims, <laughs> you know, based on this uh, similarity. Uh, but uh, as I have mentioned uh, earlier, the best way when you make a comparison, uh, look at the ontology of Marx and Ibn Khaldun. So Ibn Khaldun uh, believes in uh, multiplex ontology. He believes there is visible world and there is invisible world and there is God. How about Marx? He believes there is only material world. You know, nothing beyond material world. Uh, uh, he thinks it's like a superstition, <laughs> you know, to believe in the invisible world and in God. Uh, uh, so you see, they have different uh, ontologies, and the same way, uh, uh, when you look, when you look at their epistemology, Marx never accepts divine revelation as a source of knowledge, but Ibn Khaldun accepts divine revelation as a source of knowledge. Uh, uh, but they share uh, importance of uh, empirical knowledge and rational knowledge, uh, so th there is something common. There is something common, but uh, Ibn Khaldun is much richer, more, much more comprehensive than, uh, uh, than Marx. Uh, so economy is important for Ibn Khaldun, but at the same time, you know, Asabiyya is very important. You know, uh, I mean, we read this citation, right? Uh, this Asabiyya, this, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, unity of hearts. But uh, for Marx, unity of interest. Uh, through class, uh, uh, so and uh, and when Ibn Khaldun uh, talks about social conflict, he doesn't base it on class. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, in Ibn Khaldun, there is uh, conflict and solidarity. Okay, but uh, Marx, like completely conflict between two classes. Uh, this dialectic materialism, this is his method. And, uh, but Ibn Khaldun does not use dialectic materialism. You know, uh, his uh, method is very different than uh, Marx. Uh, as I have said, uh, you know, there are similarities, uh, but these similarities uh, never uh, proves that uh, you know, they are the same people. <laughs> you know, uh, and actually, multiplex thinkers always have some similarities with materialists, always have similarities with idealists, always have some similarities with mystics, always have some similarities with people of uh, religion, but uh, only at one particular level. You know, uh, so like uh, we take care of material factors. We believe, you know, interests are important in analyzing history and society. But we never say everything can be explained by interest. You know, uh, so that's the difference. You know, I mean, we accept material uh, factors, but we are not reductionist. So we are as materialist as Marx, but we are not reductionist. Uh, and we are as idealist as, let's say, Max Weber, but we are not reductionist. Uh, we don't say. You know, uh, we can explain everything by material causes. But we say material causes are important and they may help us, you know, understand and explain certain phenomena uh, in society. And the same way, like ideas are important, feelings are important, uh, but we don't say we can explain everything by ideas. Uh, so, you know, interests play a role in society and sometimes ideas play a role in society. So this multiplexity allows us to bring together, you know, uh, in a holistic, comprehensive way, uh, the material factors as well as the ideal uh, factors in understanding what's going on in society.
Yes. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there's just continuing on with the comments. Ishfaq Ahmed Taku says, uh, does it mean that morality or religion is the prime cause of rise and fall of civilizations? Uh, uh, according to Ibn Khaldun, uh, uh, like loyalty to uh, religion uh, plays a very important role in so, in keeping so, uh, asabiyya, the group unity, uh, solidarity, and uh, passion. You know, uh, to to work together. Uh, uh, and uh, if it's grounded in religion uh, and people remain loyal to those religious values, uh, then their society will survive longer. You know? But if they give up on those religious values, their society will disintegrate. Uh, so you observe this today in secular societies, they gave up on like religious values uh, now uh, you see morality is completely decreasing individualism like extremist individualism you know spreading and you know, people don't care about uh, each other no more charity you know uh, no more community uh, i mean even today we can observe uh, you know the uh, the impact of the uh, absence of religion and the secularization uh, uh, so uh, uh, according to Ibn Khaldun, you know, uh, uh, religion uh, plays a very important, very strong uh, role in uh, in uh, uh, sustaining a social unity uh, and uh, asabiyya. Thank you. Um, again, in the comments, uh, Arshid asks. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Professor. In a narration of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he quotes hadith in Arabic. My Arabic is a bit less rusty, but I'll try anyways. Laysa minna man da'a ila asadiyatin, aw man qatala min ajli asadiyati, aw man mamata min ajli asadiyati. Is this the same asabiya Ibn Khaldun uh, talking of, or a different one? If it's the same, then fostering this asabiya is in contradictory to Sharia. And if it's a different one, then what kind of asabiya is this? Yes, uh, uh, this is asabiya to jahiliya, the jahiliya group uh, unity, uh, right. and the and the the pre-Islamic uh, unity of uh, tribalism. So the pre-Islamic tribalism was based on this uh, you know unity of the tribe and uh, tribe members supporting each other regardless of whether they are right and wrong so uh, i mean if you are from one tribe you have to support all other tribe members uh, regardless whether they are right thing or wrong thing so this was called asabiyyat al-jahiliya or the tribal uh, asabiyya of course, this is wrong. You know, uh, this is wrong. Uh, the, uh, 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 I mean, uh, sociologically speaking, this kind of asabiyya may exist in societies, but uh, we don't approve it uh, Islamically. Islamically, uh, the, this asabiyya must be grounded on religion, as the previous. Uh, 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 friend mentioned, uh, like uh, you know, religion uh, sh uh, should bring us together. You know, uh, not the tribalism. You know, we should not get together because we belong. You know, uh, to the same tribe, but we belong to the same religion. Uh, and uh, even like we are part of a tribe, uh, our uh, morality uh, should be grounded in religion. And not just uh, tribal uh, unity and tribal uh, 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 tribal nationalism uh, or ethnic uh, uh, solidarity, regardless of religious uh, values. Uh, so Prophet Muhammad wasalam, he replaced tribal asabiyya with Islamic asabiyya. You know, the, according to Islamic asabiyya, all believers are brothers and sisters. 
and uh, Allah Taala united their hearts, as Ibn Khaldun mentioned. You know, uh, uh, so uh, so a new Asabiyya uh, emerged. This was, uh, you know, above and beyond tribal Asabiyya, and this is what made Islam a universal religion. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, if Arabs remained uh, locked uh, onto the tribal Asabiyya, they could have never established a world empire. You know, they could have never uh, developed a universal ideology or religion. Uh, only by abandoning uh, this uh, tribalistic narrow uh, approach, uh, could they establish this universal uh, worldview and the universal empire expanding, you know, from North Africa up until uh, Asia? Thank you. Uh, there are two more questions. So before that, I had a, a question of my own related to this uh, topic that we just touched about the uh, Asabia. And so, well, uh, the question is that. Uh, when we look at the expansion of the Western powers, the colonial powers in the colonial era, uh, uh, it was almost start, uh, starting to look as if uh, this hegemonic power would, uh, would topple large portions of the earth. And it did for a moment. Uh, and and uh, now it has a different, it's, you know, uh, it, that agenda seems to continue. Uh, but with different sort of uh, language, different thing. So would you say, would you agree with the observation that uh, some, uh, something very different from the Islamic uh, you know, spread and uh, the permanence of the civilization uh, with the West is that the West conquered very many places, but uh, they weren't able to make them their own it seems like there was a lot of exploitation and the exploitation tired and, and uh, tired the indigenous people, it tired the people of India, which caused them to fight against the British and get them out of there. It tired the people of Africa and they fought against those colonizers and it, it tired the people of the uh, Middle East and um, other regions. Uh, so would you think, and also in, in America though, in America's though, uh, the civilization that they took over, uh, is really struggling to uh, have any presence at all. Uh, so would you, would you think that's a fair assessment of a difference between the kind of uh, uh, you know, spread of, of, uh, of Western powers as opposed to the uh, Islamic powers? Uh, yes, uh, and I, I agree with you, uh, but uh, Ibn Haldun really is more nuanced, you know? Uh, okay. Like we say, Western power. There is no Western power. You know, there are many powers. You know, there is France, Germany, like British, American, Russian, like uh, and perhaps like UA, you know, like there are many like uh, powers, but we lump them all together. We say West and Western power. So Ibn Khaldun's view is like more nuanced. Uh, uh, and also like we say Islamic power, you know, and the uh, there is not like a unified, uh, like a single uh, Islamic power. Of, of course, it's the ideal. Like there should be like one Muslim uh, ummah, you know, uh, all united under a single uh, leader. But it, it has never been uh, so. Uh, 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 so th those people they compete, you know, with each other. Uh, they make wars with each other. And they make war with outsiders. So, like, look at the uh, First World War. It was a war between Western powers as well as with powers outside. Look at you know World War Two, and look at now the war in uh, like Europe between Russia and Ukraine. And these are two Western uh, people, right? Both Christian Western, uh, like one. I mean, like Orthodox, the other is uh, Catholic and also Orthodox, you know, uh, like even from the same religion. Uh, so you see, uh, so uh, we, we should be like more nuanced uh, uh, in our approach rather than uh, totalizing. Uh, and uh, 
uh, in its totality, uh, Western civilization, if you assume that there is such a thing, it will not survive forever. You know, uh, it has an end. Or if we have like a nuanced view, all these small powers you know, in the Western geography, they will not survive uh, forever uh, either. Uh, according to Ibn Khaldun, uh, the secret of the survival of a, a society or state is justice. Justice. So uh, look, all our ulama, uh, including Ibn Khaldun, they argued that uh, uh, al-mulku uh, yadumu bil-kufri wala yadumu bil-zulm. So political power uh, may survive uh, with uh, disbelief, like uh, uh, with the uh, wrong ideology, wrong religion, as long as there is justice. But it cannot survive with injustice, even if they have the right religion. You know, uh, so uh, uh, because right religion uh, must be uh, genuinely practiced to uh, bring justice in a society. So uh, like if people claim that they belong to the right religion, but they don't practice it genuinely, honestly, and there is no justice in practice in uh, society, that kind of society will collapse. You know, uh, so justice is the key you know, for the survival of a society or the a state. But of course, uh, uh, I mean, social justice has different levels. Uh, so if there is minimum uh, level of uh, social justice, then society will survive and continue to exist. Uh, but uh, if there is less than the minimum required level, uh, it is uh, doomed to fail. Uh, uh, so this is also a very objective observation by Ibn Khaldun. He never says uh, societies must be Muslim you know, uh, to be able to uh, survive. You know, uh, his uh, perspective is very objective. Uh, he, he says uh, being Muslim alone uh, does not ensure uh, uh, survival of a society. Uh, justice ensures, regardless whether you are Muslim or non-Muslim. And he says that the delil, the evidence for this, past empires, there were like Roman Empire, you know, uh, with a wrong religion, the polytheist, you know, idol worshippers. But uh, they survived for so many centuries. So what made them survive? They had, you know, some kind of justice. You know, same thing. Chinese Empire, you know, it survived for so many centuries. And he says the secret of it is that they had some kind of justice. You know, the required amount of justice existed, uh, and people, uh, this justice made people loyal, you know, to their state. Uh, uh, and uh, this justice provided by the state uh, brought uh, legitimacy to the political power. Uh, but if there's no justice, uh, the state loses its legitimacy and uh, collapses. Uh, uh, so for Ibn Khaldun, uh, justice is the most crucial thing you know, uh, for the uh, survival of the state. Uh, and uh, linking this back to what you have mentioned, uh, because those uh, uh, empires, colonizers, they did not practice justice in those areas they colonized, they lost them. You know, but if they treated uh, people in the colonies in a just way, they could have stayed there longer. Uh, so injustice made them lose the legitimacy of their power and people fought against them until they kicked them out. Uh, Thank you, Professor. I think uh, uh, Daniel had his hand up. I've just missed it. And, and uh, can I request him to, if he still has that question, to please? Oh, uh, thank you, Brother Yamin. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Professor Santok. Uh, 
Alaikum salam. I've heard your name from my teacher, Dr. Sajaman, a lot. Uh, so today I got this opportunity and I jumped in. And, you know, it was really an insightful session. Thank you very much for that. Yes, so, please do. Uh, Give my salam to Professor Asad. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. So uh, what I've understood from your talk, and especially the last idea at the conclusion in which you were talking about epistemic sustainability, so you're basically proposing that the Islamic theory of knowledge has a divine source of knowledge as well. Uh, you know, along with your intellect, observation, and then you you have the divine source. So, I mean, you know, I think uh, that my question might sound uh, a bit practical, but I think it's philosophical as well, political as well. Uh, you know, we are faced with this question, then who should lead us then? Uh, and who should lead the Muslim society? So based on your talk, you know, what I understand is that orthodox classic uh, ulama should lead us. Why? Because when you say that, uh, you know, our epistemic framework has a divine, what you call, uh, element as well, then it means that somebody who is very close to the divine element, they are more suitable for, you know, leadership. And when I say that, you know, they are more close, it means that somebody who's trained in Islamic discourse. And training in Islamic discourse is slightly different because it involves knowledge, information, but it involves ihsan as well. So as I understand, somebody who follows sunnah, somebody who is really you know, orthodox Muslim, then he or she, I'm not saying she, but he, obviously, <laughs> because the dominant opinion is, obviously, it might sound controversial. I'm sorry, but I don't know why it sounds controversial for Muslims. But uh, I think somebody who's you know really orthodox Muslim, uh, then uh, or who's classically trained, uh, then I think I think that would be the logical conclusion of what you were saying. I, I just you need your comment. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is a very good uh, question, and it reflects the uh, pseudo dilemmas uh, we uh, fell in. You know, uh, like this orthodox and non orthodox. Uh, you know, uh, etc. I mean. Uh, uh, these uh, uh, names and this kind of classifications uh, uh, is not going to uh, lead us to uh, good conclusions. Uh, 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 so we need ulama, uh, and uh, we have to talk about what kind of ulama we need today. And the ulama we need today should be rooted, you know, in our uh, tradition. Uh, in the, uh, the sacred uh, uh, divine knowledge, but uh, simply being rooted in the uh, traditional uh, sacred or divine knowledge uh, is not enough uh, to make somebody an alim. Uh, an alim should also be grounded in the reality we live in. You know, uh, the economic reality, the political reality, social reality, cultural reality, you know, we live in. Uh, so uh, I consider people who are grounded both in uh, traditional Islamic knowledge as well as the, uh, the present day reality we live in, uh, real alim. Uh, uh, so our ulama in the past, they were like this. You know, uh, they were not like... Uh, the way you put it, like orthodox ulama detached from the reality they lived in. Uh, uh, so the alim, the kind of alim we need today uh, should be similar to uh, Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Ahmed bin Hanbal, Imam Ghazali, you know, well-rooted uh, in the uh, Islamic uh, tradition, the disciplines of uh, Sharia, but at the same time, very much aware of what's going on in the world. What are the problems uh, Ummah is facing economically, politically, culturally? What are the problems humanity is facing? You know, what's the best way for us, you know, to uh, spread the message of Islam, you know, to uh, humanity? Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, the, basically, the, what will lead the Ummah is the true ulama, true ulama, following the model of the great ulama uh, of the past uh, who were grounded both 
in the scriptural uh, you know, uh, traditional knowledge, but at the same time, who were deeply aware of the uh, political, economic, cultural, social reality in which uh, uh, they lived. Uh, so that's the that's the uh, kind of ulama who may lead uh, the ummah out of the crisis uh, we are in today. Uh, thank thank you. you, Professor. Uh, I agree with you. I agree with you. I understand this. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, we need ulama who are grounded in both what you call. They know the world yes. and they know the divine as well. Yes. Yeah. So uh, do you think that so, this, so this is the, this is the kind of ulama uh, which we call dhul janahain. Yes, yes. Dhul janahain. The, the, the alim with two wings. Yes. You know, the wing of traditional knowledge and the wing of modern uh so, knowledge uh, so if you allow me i just want to ask uh, one more thing yes you please. see uh during the time of moguls i think it was during the time of king Aurangzeb, this batava Hangiri was compiled okay so you see at that time uh the ulama were in the government right and they were yes. doing the thing they were like kazi and they were you know collecting tax and they were all all involved into this government bureaucracy everything whereas today what has happened is that because of this colonization and, you know, this modern nation state, our ulama class has been secluded. Mm -hmm. And we are expecting a lot from that, that they should do this, they should do this. But, you know, how they'll be able to do it until, unless they come into the limelight. I mean, if, for example, in my country, the bureaucracy, we don't take bureaucracy from the ulama class. We don't take uh, the lawyers from the madrasa or anything. So, I mean, how they are going to do that? That's also a practical difficulty which we have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the impact of uh, modernization, westernization, and colonization undermined the institutions uh, which produced uh, a strong and true ulama, like the, uh, 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 let's say, where is the Suleimani Madrasa? You know, uh, where is the uh, Bayazid Madrasas? You know, the you know, those madrasas, they were well-funded at that time. They had very prestigious architectural, like monuments, you know, which housed uh, the students. Uh, so today, you know, uh, we have on, only like remnants of these glorious uh, institutions uh, uh, who, which produced those great uh, ulama. Uh, uh, so uh, the colonization, westernization, modernization marginalized the ulama, and instead, uh, you know, it uh, developed a new group of uh, educated uh, people, professionals, out of the modern university. But modern university, in general, is an instrument of westernization, cultural colonization. Uh, uh, so uh, this is how uh, it uh, functions uh, in uh, majority of the non-Western countries. I mean, uh, universities are instruments of uh, Westernizing those countries and culturally uh, colonizing them and modernizing them. So the, the elite uh, started being produced by these uh, uh, modern uh, institutions and uh, the traditionally educated uh, ulama, they became marginalized. Uh, uh, and uh, they're like madrasas, they are not accredited. So you may study in madrasa 40 years uh, and your education does not count. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, so they are not accredited. So they are not uh, given the, uh, the, the the respect uh, you know they need uh, and uh, so this undermines and weakens uh, their status uh, and their perception in uh, society and uh, uh, so it has consequences you know on the society in general as well so it produced a new division and conflict between modern academics and intellectuals and traditional ulama you know, uh, so uh, this division, uh, I think, detrimental, you know, for the uh, ummah, 
Because in the past, we have never had such a division. We had only like ulama finished. Uh, uh, but now we have like a two groups of people. One is like educated uh, very well, like in Oxford, Cambridge, or like the best uh, universities. Uh, you know, uh, so they know everything inside out about what's going on in the world. Uh, but then you have like a traditional ulama, they know inside out all the Quran, Hadith, Fiqh, everything, but they have very limited knowledge of what's happening uh, in the world uh, today. Uh, you're right, so doctor. Thank a, you very much. It's a very important uh, and detrimental division that we are facing today. The solution is combining the knowledge of that academic and the knowledge of that alim together in one person. And I call it Alim academic. Alim academic. In okay. alim academic. That's the uh, new type of alim that we need uh, today, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. Very well. Thank you. Very well. Assalamu alaikum. 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 Assalamu Sayyid Mustafa Akbar asks, uh, this might not be directly related, but I'll ask anyway. What is your view of the Hadith? Caliphate is from Quraysh and its relation to the Ottoman Empire. Did the Ottoman Caliphs fulfill this requirement? This is the first question. The second question he asks is, uh, the okay, Hadith- Let's go one by one. Uh, I mean, <laughs> okay. like, okay. uh, like uh, all ulama, uh, during the uh, Ottoman period, agreed that the uh, Ottoman uh, caliphs, Khulafa uh, al-Uthmaniyin, they uh, uh, carried all the uh, qualifications required to become Khalifa. So who are we today coming after like uh, centuries, uh, you know, uh, to uh, rethink, to argue, no, they were not uh, qualified or something like this. This discussion, I think, is a uh, is is a it doesn't have any benefit or any uh, fruit, uh, uh, given the fact that uh, the ulama, you know, uh, like for so many centuries all over the world, you know, uh, at that time you know, they all agreed. Okay, you know, uh, the Ottoman uh, Khalifa is the uh, legitimate and the right uh, Khalifa, uh, but these questions they were raised by the. A European uh, colonialist and imperialist, you know, to uh, create doubts about the uh, Ottoman uh, Khalifa uh, because uh, they wanted to create friction, you know, uh, in the Ummah uh, because they wanted to like uh, separate like the East Indian Muslims, Arab Muslims from the authority of the Khalifa. So they spread this kind of uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, as if uh, the ulama in the past, they were ignorant. They did not know this hadith. They did not know like uh, all other things. <laughs> uh, and uh, suddenly like uh, they discovered uh, these things. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it requires another like long explanation uh, uh, about how we should properly understand this hadith. Uh, you know, uh, so this hadith uh, applies to the time of uh, Rasulullah alayhi wa sallam, it's a period uh, during which Quraysh uh, was respected uh, uh, as the only uh, tribe which may have power you know, uh, and demand respect from all other tribes. You know, uh, no other tribe you know, uh, would uh, command respect from all other, other, uh, other tribes. Uh, uh, so this was a very practical uh, uh, advice by Rasulullah uh, alayhi salatu uh, 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 because it was the noble uh, tribe uh, and everyone respected them. But there was no question uh, to uh, respect the Ottoman dynasty, like a Khalifa from the Ottoman. Uh, uh, so, uh, so this hadith does not apply uh, to the Ottoman, uh, 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 the Khalifa from the Ottomans, uh, uh, if they were coming from a 
like ethnic or uh, tribal background, people disgust, disgust and uh, hate and the disregard, don't respect, then you can say, okay, this hadith applies to them also, but there was no such uh, problem. As I said, like all ulama agreed for so many centuries <laughs> that they are like right uh, khalifas. Who are we to come up like centuries later and tell them, no, 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 they were not uh, legitimate. Uh, uh, so it's a useless discussion. Uh, I, I, uh, there's no point like in wasting our time, you know, uh, uh, dealing with them. Okay, so thank you, Professor. And uh, so his next question, I didn't quite understand it, but I'll read it out anyways. And it says, uh, the hadith of eating the roots of the plants, when should one initiate such protocol? I, I think he's referring to, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, like uh, ijma. Like I think there's a hadith about ijma. Like uh, uh, no, I think you know. Uh, I you know, know I, I I recommend that you know one goes to the uh, shuru, shuru, shuru like the commentaries, commentaries of a hadith to properly understand them. Yeah, and he has a last question before uh, before I, I think he says. Uh, could you comment on the hadith regarding cutting of the hands where it says by Allah if Fatima were to steal I would be the first one to cut off her hand previous nations were destroyed because they punished the poor but left the rich alone so there's uh, he, I guess he wants a comment so what kind that. of comment uh, I can make on this hadith here is a very important uh, hadith uh, you know reminding us that uh, penalties should should be implemented equally on everyone regardless of their uh, family background or prestige or status in uh, society. Uh, so it's about like equality before law. So it, 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 uh, it reinforces the, uh, or it established the point about justice uh, that you yeah, mentioned yeah, earlier, yeah, 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 which yeah, is yeah. a very principal. Yeah, uh, yeah equal, equal justice, you know, equality justice. before law. Uh, so, you know, not exempting, you know, uh, some group of people from getting punished, you know, uh, because of their uh, mistakes. Uh, uh, so, you know, like rules and laws, penalties should be equally implemented to uh, uh, everybody, regardless of uh, who they are, what's their social status. All right. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone. That's all the time we have tonight. Uh, the next lecture is on Tuesday, 6th, June, 2023, uh, on the topic, Ibn Khaldun on good governance, uh, circle of justice. Uh, more details will be shared in our WhatsApp group. I am going to uh, share the link, uh, links again uh, uh, in, in the chat. Uh, so please feel free to join if you haven't uh, done it yet. The link is in the chat. So here, here here's the link again. I'd leave the... Uh, uh, you know, the room open for another five minutes. So that's so uh, you can click on the links and join the groups uh, group and that, uh, make a note of them. Uh, but we thank uh, Professor Dr. Rajiv Shantak for preparing the slides and delivering the lecture. And we also thank all of you for taking part and making valuable contributions in the comments and question and answer section. We're very much looking forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Uh, goodbye for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.